This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, this is Saratoga Valentine, MJ in the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Tommy's a free spirit who wants to know about your career and your belly button. You've been warned. Later, Tiger. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the gorgeous, the talented, the funny Lisa Raggio. Lisa did the voice of Zerana on G.I. Joe the series and the 1987 movie, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. She also was on the Private Benjamin um, spinoff sitcom uh, from 1981 to 1983. She also played a reporter in the early Tom Hanks comedy, The Man with One Red Shoe. Um, she guest starred on so many shows. I mean, she had a memorable uh, two-part uh, episode role on Mary with Children as Peg's uh, rival Connie Bender. She also guest starred on It's a Living, Perfect Strangers, Days of Our Lives. She was in the Fabulous Baker Boys. She was one of the bad singers. She'll be my fourth bad singer from that movie, which is pretty bizarre and pretty awesome at the same time. And it's going to be a great conversation today. I'm uh, getting an overwhelming response of, uh, from people on social media who know Lisa, and they're glad that I'm going to be talking to her today. She is loved by her peers. That is so awesome. I am so jealous and so happy at the same time. <laughs> so yeah, here is my interview with Lisa Raggio. Hey Lisa, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am excellent. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I am doing just spectacular and I cannot tell you what a great, great what a great honor this is. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, listen, I'm thrilled. I, I love doing stuff like this, and that's so kind of you to think of me. Thank uh, you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Well, you know what? Yes. I have to say that I did. Um, I just found a while back all of these, uh, you know, videos that, you know, the home movies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. What were my parents thinking? They must have been going, oh, my God, what are we going to do with her? Because I was, you know, singing and dancing and all of them. And, and then I actually started auditioning very early on because, uh, yeah, I was born and raised in, in Manhattan. Yeah. And, and part of the time I spent in Staten Island. Um, and thank God for Pete Davidson because now Staten Island is on the map again. And, uh, <laughs> and the other guy, the wonderful guy that does the news. Uh, his name escapes me right now. Um, but in any event, uh, because I was in New York City, I had the opportunities and the advantages to start studying voice very early on and dance, and then I started auditioning for things. As a matter of fact, the very first show I ever auditioned for, and I went to an open call, and it was for Jesus Christ Superstar. Ooh. For, for the original Broadway production. And it's actually kind of a very interesting story. Uh, I think I was number 385. I, I don't know. I just waited on the line, waited on the <laughs> line, and then you go in and sing 16 bars, and, and that's it. And uh, Tom O'Horgan was the director on that, and they, you know, asked me some the paper, gave me papers to fill out, you know, my name, my address, all that stuff. And then they asked me when my birthday was. So I put it down, and mm -hmm. they gave me a call back, and they had me come back and sing, and they wanted me to sing something really belty, and at the time, I, there was a show on Broadway running called um, uh, The Me Nobody Knows, which was a, a really wonderful show. Irene Cara was in it, yeah. and Beverly Ann Brammer. It was a great show all about young kids. And so I picked something from that. I went back, I sang for them, and Tom O'Horgan looked at me, and he said, well, I'm not going to use you. I think you're wonderful, but I'm not going to use you. And he said, I'm going to tell you why. And he said, we had your astrological chart done, and I just don't want to work with any Taurus people in this production. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and, I, and I went, what? And of course, I, I got, I was glad, I mean, I was so young at that time, I thought, yeah, okay, so what? So I go home, and my mother says, to my mother, who was really into astrology and whatnot, she mm -hmm. said, how did it go? And I looked at her, and I said, astrologically rejected. And uh, it just, 
I always think about that and think, I, how many other people have ever said, yeah, no, they're not hiring me because they don't want any, you know, whatever in this particular show. Yeah. So it was pretty crazy. Um, but that's kind of what started it. And so by the time I was through with high school and I selected college, I wasn't going to go out of town because when you live in New York City and that's where Broadway is, why would you go somewhere else? Right. You know? So um, yeah. that's kind of how it all started. Uh, it started me singing. I, I think my, my big love was always singing. I really never planned to be in Broadway shows. What I was hoping for was a recording career. That's what I always wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, that didn't pan out. Uh, but, you know, hey, uh, other things did. So that was, that was very cool, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, I, I was supposed to be a Taurus. I was two weeks overdue, and I'm a Gemini. <laughs> oh, and that's so funny. I was supposed to be an Aries, and I was a bit. I was late, and my mo and I wound up being a Taurus. And I teased my mother for years, saying, "You have no idea how lucky you were that I wasn't an Aries, <laughs> because my mom was a Capricorn, and at least there's a you know commonality there between the elements of those two signs." Mm. But. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. So when's your birthday? June, Are you a May Gemini? No, June 6th. Oh, you're early on. Okay. Yeah, I get it. That's cool. Excellent. Yeah, I was supposed, so, to, um, I was supposed to be like May 18th or something like that. May what? Say again? I, I was supposed to be like May 18th or something like that. Oh, yes. Right. Close to the end of, close to the end of Taurus. Right. Well, listen, you're in good company. That is a great, great sign, Gemini. Um, I love it. Uh, they're all about, you're, you're certainly doing the right job because they're all about communication and making connections. So um, mm -hmm. that's, it's very cool that you do what you do. It really is. Absolutely. You're great at that. Absolutely. I'm an onion with many layers. <laughs> yes, sure. I like that. An onion with many layers. I'm going to, I'm going to think about that from time to time. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, Trying to think of what else I, I well, you you asked me. I've got so many things. I don't want to go off in too okay. many directions. So <laughs> you 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 channel me in. I I can get. I have quite a bit of Gemini in my chart, so I can you know bounce off a little bit. Which <laughs> you want to keep me on track. So so after high school, did you did you, did you um, you know study acting anywhere? I didn't, as a matter of fact. Um, I wanted to at the time. NYU didn't have this school. It wasn't Tisch. It was just NYU School of the Arts. And my parents were really funny. I mean, I wanted to go there because I was going to stay in the city. And it was not in a good neighborhood at all. And my father said, you're not going down to that neighborhood. What are you, out of your mind? You can't go down there. So I wound up going to NYU, but I went down to the Washington Square College. Uh, the, the school of acting at the time was over kind of in the lower, the East Village but where it wasn't, it wasn't in a great location. Um, so I went to Washington Square College and um, actually went into school pre-med. That did not last long. And we're all happy for that because I'm not a person you want as your doctor. Trust yeah. me. Uh, I, have, I have good qualities and then no qualities and no qualities for that. So the professor who bounced me out of that class, God bless him. He saved everybody a whole lot of hardship. Uh, and so I just wound up uh, getting a bachelor's in um, psych, a double major psych in English, and kept doing all my singing and dancing and all of the rest of that training, you know, separate. I didn't do any of that connected to a school. You know, so it was kind of interesting because, as I said, you know, my, my goal was to be a, just a recording artist. And as a folk, uh, the day I graduated from NYU, I had a call back for a Broadway show. And underneath my cap and gown, I was wearing my leotard, my tights, and my complete outfit to go back to my call back for the magic show on Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, and I went back, and they were interested in me for the assistant to Doug Henning, who had to fit into the boxes and do all the <laughs> illusions. I just couldn't fit in. I was too tall. So I didn't get that job. but. Uh, God bless those casting people, uh, Johnson Lift. They kept bringing me back and bringing me back, and um, I got Grease. And that was the beginning of my entire career. Um, I got Grease in the, actually it was like a second national that went out. Uh, I graduated June of 74, and by August, I was already in rehearsal for Grease in, 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 in Coconut Grove. 
Uh, and then that tour ended, and then I went out on another tour with them in 75, and um, then just went from show to show to show. It was pretty pretty wild. Because it wasn't anything I planned for. Mm-hmm. So when that kind of thing happens, it, it, you know, of course now, I mean, I'm, I'm much more much older and looking back on it and thinking, wow, that was really kind of crazy the way that happened. I guess some higher force was directing me in that, in that direction, I guess. Yeah. Because it wasn't anything that I planned for. Um, so and, it was great. And, and speaking of Greece, I'm very, very happy to announce this. And you can, I'm sharing this on your show because other people will hopefully, you know, pick this up and decide to run with it. Mm-hmm. This year... Greece, on February 14th of this year, Greece became 50 years old, which is astounding to me because it it felt like it was just yesterday. So we are having a huge, we couldn't do it on the 14th, which was the anniversary because of COVID, Uh, but Mm -hmm. on June 7th, there is going to be a great big uh, hoopla in New York City, and all of the Greasers, we are going to be gathered together, and in honor of all of that, we have put together a book, which uh, this is my shameless plug. Go on Amazon and pre-order it. It's called Tell Me More, Tell Me More. Yes. And it's all, it's all great stories. Uh, I've contributed a bunch of stories. A lot of the other Greasers have contributed stories. And it's going to be just a really great book. We're very excited about it. So right. if anybody's out there that loves it, go do it. I, I talked to Adrienne Barbeau in November, and she told me about, about the book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love her. She yeah. is, I have to tell you, I had the pleasure of uh, doing a movie with her back in, oh my goodness, I'm trying to think of when, what year it was. I can't remember what year. Somewhere in the, either the late 90s or the early 2000s. In any event, we shot a movie called Awake in Providence in Providence, Rhode Island, and we played sisters. Uh-huh. And I was, I was so thrilled. She is the best person in this business. She is such a great human being and such a lady. I love her. She's just wonderful. Yeah, when when, when I put when I um, uh, advertised that I was going to be talking to you yesterday, the first person to like it was Billy Van Zant. Ah, right. Billy did. Billy wrote the movie. Yeah. His um, unfortunately deceased partner now, Jane Milmore, and Billy was also in the movie. Right. So we had a blast. We had just a great time. It was it was a wonderful experience. And um, mm-hmm. so happy. Adrienne has been very um, uh, helpful and actually at the helm, not the, not just helpful, but she's been at the helm of putting this book together with our director, Tom Moore, and of course, uh, one of our original producers, Ken Wasteman. So it's, it's going to be really great. And we have lots of Zooms. We are, we're with Zoomathons, these greases. We the last one we were on, which was February 14th. I think there had to be 30 some odd people on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. It was crazy. Um, but we, we're a tight family, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy, and I feel privileged to have been a part of that iconic show. I really do. Yeah, um, so when... That, that was great. Yeah, so when you were in it, like, like, like who, was it, who else was in it? Well, I did it at different times and with many different people. When I first went in in 1974, which was the Florida company, I, went in, I was Frenchy. Uh-huh. And in that production, the person you would most recognize now is Mimi Kennedy. I don't know if you know oh, Mimi. Oh, yeah. She was on um, oh, that wonderful show, Mom. Yeah. You see that when that was on? She, she's been on a lot of things. Yeah. She was uh, Jan in that company. The Zuko was not someone you would have recognized. And, and actually, our Sandy was Robin Lamont, who was the original Day by Day girl from Godspell. Oh, nice. So, uh, she was in it, and then the next time I did it, well, let's see, the different Zucos, I've worked with uh, Peter Gallagher, I've worked with Tree Williams, I've worked <laughs> with Patrick Swayze, um, who else have I worked with? Dave, David I Pamer? Think, I'm sorry. It was David Pamer there? Yes, I think I did, I think David did, uh, you know, with Greece, I know David. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Greece, what often happened was because the show was so physical, especially for the guys, people would get hurt. Yeah. Often. So they were forever flying somebody else in or sending somebody else in to cover. And I think David came in for a while in some company that I did. Um, but 
it, you know, it, it was really great. I mean, uh, it was a really great experience, and um, I'm so happy that I that I've got that group of people as part of my life. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, Greece has just become just this this wonderful yeah. phenomenon, you know. And the other thing that was very cool about it was that I originally when I was cast as Frenchie, um, mm -hmm. you know, they always thought I would play Rizzo, and then finally I did, and I did Rizzo on Broadway. So that was great because I always I always felt that was the better role for me. But I actually hands down loved playing Frenchie because she's just such a lovable character, you know. Mm hmm. So after that run was over, did you move to Los Angeles? No, I did not because uh, Greece happened intermittently. So 74 and 75, I did Greece as Frenchie um, out on the road. And then in 75, I left Greece and went into the magic show finally on Broadway, but in a different role. I stayed in that for two and a half years. And then uh, the beginning of 78, I left that to go into the first national tour of Annie. And that was a great experience. I played Lily St. Regis. I got to work with some really wonderful people. Gary Beach was my rooster. Um, if somebody was taken far too soon, he was just a really great guy. And yeah. then after Annie, I came back off the road. I went back into Greece on Broadway for a short time as Frenchie. And then I got a Broadway show that was hideous. Biggest flop ever called Got to Go Disco. It was awful. <laughs> I tell you. It was so bad. It was just unbelievably bad. I remember my mother coming to see it, and um, she looked at me afterwards after the opening night. And she said, "Because I had been offered Annie on Broadway, yeah, but I wanted to, I wanted to originate a role, you know, silly me. I had already done that role for, you know, twelve months, fourteen months. So yeah, it wasn't that eager to go back into a role I'd already done. I thought, oh, this will be great, and Got to Go Disco started out as what seemed to be a good idea because it was going to be an all disco musical and it was music by lots of different people, Ashford and Simpson. Yeah. Um, we had a, a three-tiered band that sat, it was so ridiculous. They wanted a unit that moved up and down the stage. Irene Carroll was in the show. Um, it, it just was dreadful. The show was dreadful. And um, my mother came opening night and said to me, you turned Annie down for this? <laughs> you need your head examined. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, not good. Not to, it, uh, and you know, I don't know. Did you happen to watch recently this Netflix thing on Halston? Did you watch that? No. Oh, man. I, I was very interested in Halston. So I said, well, let me, you know, we, my husband and I were watching it. And all of a sudden, they have another character in it named Joe, and they call Halston's assistant, Joe Eula, Joe Eula. I said to Kenny, I know that name. Well, then I, it clicked. He was the costume designer <laughs> who got to go disco. And they actually played some hits from it in the television series, uh, in, in that episode, well, in a couple of episodes. Yeah. Because Joe Eula was also involved with it. It, it just was a weird thing. I, I never thought I would ever hear the name Got to Go Disco mentioned again, and there it was. <laughs> so that made me laugh. Yeah, get... uh, after that, after that, I just, I'll finish this up so we can move on. After <laughs> Got to Go Disco, I went back into Greece on Broadway as Rizzo. I stayed there until, um, I guess that was 78 or 79, and then I went to L.A. And uh, I stayed in L.A. then after that, from like 80 on. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like you got some closure that someone from that play uh, besides yourself also uh, was successful after it flopped. <laughs> oh, my God. It was just uh, really, it was insane. Irene Karen never came back after opening night. Oh, God. <laughs> no, she's, I'm not kidding you. She never came back. Every time the closing notice would go up. How many performances? <laughs> go off in every dressing room because we go, yes, we're free, we're free. And then by the time intermission was over, they, they take the notice down and we'd all go, oh, my God, no. And we were so scared to quit because there was all these rumors about mafia money and mob money and drug money. It was creepy. It was a really creepy experience. Yeah, how, many how many performances, though? 
did they do? You know, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I know that the goofy guy who was the producer, Jerry Brandt, mm-hmm. who had never produced anything on Broadway, but he was the guy who brought us the French jeans store. Mm-hmm. And I think he had something to do with something called the Electric Circus, which was a, I don't know, disco kind of place, because we are talking uh, 1979. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he kept postponing the opening. This ought to give you an idea. He figured we'd open over Memorial Day weekend because he thought all the critics would be out in Fire Island and no one would review the show. <laughs> oh. think, you know, this is what we call genius production, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I, we, in my opinion, we ran too long because, you know, we were like, oh, no, please, God, is there no end to this? Uh, but I, I, I don't know, maybe we lasted two months. Maybe. Okay. And, and I have to tell you this, every time, all we ever did was rehearse the opening number. <laughs> and he would bring in these guys that were like, they really looked like gangsters. Yeah. They really did. He'd bring them in, and he would sit them down, and he would say, okay, uh, we're going to do the opening number again. Uh, and he'd look at the guy. we'd hear him, and he'd look at the guys, and goes, you know, okay, to the to the stage manager, get the girls out there, uh, you know, you're going to love it, these girls are really hot, man, okay, go ahead, girls, stop dancing, oh, it's just, it, it, was, it was awful, really awful, yeah. Oh, my God, so how do you get cast on the Private Benjamin series? That was an interesting story, because I went out to L.A. never having done any TV at mm-hmm. all. And I only had my Broadway show credits. And I remember I couldn't get an agent. And my agent in New York had no office in in L.A. And they couldn't help me. So I went in and, you know, nobody would take me. Every agent I met with, they'd say, no, you know, go back to New York. You're never going to work in TV. You know, you've got no TV credits. And so I did something that only because I was young, I probably was able to do it. I found out who the casting person was which you could never do this now because, as you know, you can't get through to anybody anymore. You know, it's like they've got barrier, barrier, barrier. But I got this lovely woman on the, on the phone. I think her name was Pat Harris. Mm-hmm. And uh, she actually answered the phone. And I said, oh, Miss, Miss Harris, I, I, you don't know me. I told her my name, told her my situation. The movie had just come out. I said, I don't have any uh, L.A. representation. I have these Broadway show credits. I know I'm really right for this role. Could you please at least see me? And she did. Shock of shock. She did. Uh-huh. So I went in and I read for her. And she said, you don't have an agent? I said, no. She said, I'm going to help you, and I'm bringing you to the producers. And I got the part. Oh, that's awesome. It was like, yeah, that's like the best story ever. It is. That was the best story ever. I mean, because, I, I mean, I was shocked. I mean, how, you know that's never going to happen nowadays. I mean, you, you can't get anybody on the phone, first of all. No less they're going to see you. Yeah. Especially if you're older, forget it. You know, forget it. Just go back to bed. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah, I know. It's hard. Were you, were you a fan of the movie? Yes. I was a fan of the movie. I thought the movie was terrific. I liked it very, very much. Um, I was shocked. Uh, and when I went up to test with the network, I tested with the girl that was in the movie. And they didn't pick her. They picked me because I thought, oh, my God, she's here. I'm never going to get them. And they, they chose me which was, uh, I guess, the, all the gods and goddesses were smiling upon me that day. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, I am sorry to have to say it was, though I loved it and it was my first television venture, it was a very, very problemed cast. Oh. And the network didn't help us out very much. They kept changing producers. They kept changing the direction. They kept changing the time slot. It was almost like they were trying to kill the show. Yeah. Um, it, it was weird, and and it's very hard when you have. I mean, Eileen Brennan, rest her soul, she was a brilliant, brilliant actress, really brilliant and crazy. You mm-hmm. know, so that was the diff- That was part of the difficulty. Then there were other cast members um, that were difficult, and it made life exceedingly hard. 
it really did make life hard. And here I was, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is the greatest thing in the world. I don't have to do, I, I don't have to kill myself, you know, eight times a week for no money. I'm doing, it was like, I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I really did. Yeah. And I was very, very sad that that show really didn't, didn't make it. And then, of course, this terrible tragedy was that Irene got in that horrible accident. Yeah. So once she got so badly injured, she couldn't come back. And uh, it brought in Polly Holiday. I don't know if you know who she is. Oh, that's uh, Flo from Alice. Yes. Yeah. Kiss, oh, my, kiss my grits. <laughs> oh, baby, honey, that was like going from the frying pan into the fire. She was I, amazing. I know that's what Joyce Boulevant told me when she worked with her on the Flo spinoff. Oh, my God. I, and, and she and the young lady playing Private Benjamin, they, they just, that didn't work out at all. Yeah. I, I've, talked, I've talked to Ann Ryerson and Lucy Webb, and uh, yeah, they told... I love them. I love them both. Yeah. They're great people. They're great people. Wonderful. Um, I never, I never get to see Lucy anymore, and I'm, I'm always screaming at her on Facebook because I, <laughs> I write to her and I go, "Hey, I still know your phone number." She hears my, or I, I write privately, go call me. I never hear from her. I don't know what her. I, I gotta, I gotta just yell at her some more. I think <laughs> I love her so much, and I, I remember a great Lucy story when we were on doing the show together. And uh, we were on a small break or something, and I was going over to craft service. And I, I said, I'm going over to craft service. Do you want me to get you anything? And she said, oh, yeah. Can you bring me a Coca-Cola? And I said, what? <laughs> she said, I just want Coca-Cola. I said, you mean like a Coca-Cola? She said, no, I don't care what kind, just a Coca-Cola. And then I realized that she's from Tennessee, and I guess down there everything that's a soda is called a Coca-Cola. Yeah. <laughs> but I teased her about that forever. I did. I thought, oh, my God, a Coca-Cola. I never heard that before. You know, hey, <laughs> that's, what we call, that's what we call it in New York, so there you have it. Um, but she, and Annie Ryerson, she's a doll. Yeah. They're both so talented. And, um, and the person I do keep in touch with mm -hmm. uh, is two people. Uh, Danita Joe Freeman, who I'm crazy for, I love Danita, mm -hmm. and my my good friend Hal Williams. Oh yeah, he's great. I used to watch him on two two seven. Oh God, he's such a good good guy, and I I saw him about two years ago, and he looks great, man. You know, and he's still he's still at it. God bless him. You know, he's in his mid eighties, and he's he yeah. looks fabulous. And how and how. You know, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, how great was Wendy Jo Sperber? Oh, Wendy was a doll. She was a, she was a lot of fun. She came in towards the end of the show because they were having so many problems on the show, they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So when we got these new producers um, who were dreadful, I can't, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. They were dreadful. Uh, but they brought in Wendy Jo. But then once they brought her in, it was like they... Nobody was served well by by these people, these two guys. But mm -hmm. Wendy was just a delight. I liked her very much, and and I'm very sorry that we don't have her anymore. You know, she was yeah. a good good person and talented. And I, I noticed that Craig T. Nelson came back um, as a different character. He did a couple episodes. Right, he did. And then what was really funny was years later, mm -hmm. my husband. I don't know if you know my husband. My husband's Ken Kimmon. My husband was on coach for nine years. Oh, okay. So he was work yeah, he was working with Craig all the time. Um, and, and that was so funny because that was probably when I went to, to see one of the first coach tapings. I hadn't seen Craig since Private Benjamin. And, uh, and it, was, it was just kind of wild because he reprieved his role from the movie. I guess they brought him back as a potential boyfriend for Eileen. But uh, that didn't... That didn't, they didn't do that for many storylines because I think he probably got really busy doing other work, you know? Yeah. Um, but that was, that was good. And, and I, I really loved, I'd have to say, if anybody said to me, what, what is your favorite thing to do? I'd say, I, I want to be on a television series again. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved working in TV. It was my favorite thing. My second favorite thing, cartoons, without a doubt. Love, yeah, love my too. I love doing animation. Which um, we're which we're gonna get to in a moment. But, oh, okay, good, excellent. 
but I wanted to ask you, you played a uh, reporter in The Man with One Red Shoe. Yes, I did. I, it was a very small part, and it was, it was fun. Um, it was so long ago, I, I barely remember it, but... Uh, it, it, yeah, it was, it was a good thing. I enjoyed that. I also had a small role in Fabulous Baker Boys. Yes, you're my fourth. Fun. You're my fourth bad singer from that movie. That's right. That's right. And you know what was really interesting in how they set that up? How? When you went in, when you went in on the audition. Okay, you mm -hmm. went in an audition, and then they decided they wanted you. So if they wanted you, then they gave you three pieces of music. And they said, go home and kind of work on these, but don't really polish them up. Just work on them so you have a basic understanding of the song. Yeah. Well, okay, so they gave me three tunes. Uh, they gave me Strangers in the Night. Yeah, no, no, My Way. Yeah, they gave me My Way. Uh, it's not unusual, the Tom Jones tune. And you know, for life of me, I can't remember what the third one was. Uh -huh. But when they, when they brought you in to shoot... They didn't let any of the women that went in ahead of you speak to any of the women on the way out because they didn't want anybody to know about what the situation was going to be in the room. Uh -huh. So when you went in, you just handed your music to a piano guy and they just said, okay, go ahead and sing because they wanted it really bad. They wanted it bad. And uh, it, it was very cool. I mean, Bo Bridges actually directed that segment, and um, he was very funny because I, he said, okay, which ones did you, I said I worked on all of them. He said, oh, I want to hear these two. It's not unusual. And then the My Way. And I was so hoping they were going to pick It's Not Unusual because what I decided to do with it was I decided to sing it like, it's not unusual to be loved by anyone, da-da-da-da-da, the horn, the horn parts on it, which go, but uh, they didn't pick that one. They picked um, My Way. We did it as kind of like a, I don't know, a, a walk. Da, 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 But they were great. The guys were great to work with. They really were. It was fun. Yeah, uh, I've, I've talked to Carol White, who played Big Rosie on Laverne Shirley, Wendy Goldman, uh -huh. who's a very funny uh, yeah. Second City and Groundlings um, performer, and then Winnie Friedman. I've talked to the four, the four of you, yeah, and it's just, it's funny, I didn't see that movie when it came out, but I remember it was always on HBO, and then about 10 years ago I saw it, and I was like, this is a pretty good movie. Yeah, I, I always thought that when I first, when I finally saw the movie at a screening, I never realized how much people smoked in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody smoking. I came out of there and I went, oh my God, my lungs. You know, it's just, it, it creates such an incredible uh, atmosphere. Winnie Friedman, she's a doll. Yeah. So sweet. And she lives, at, oh, not lives with, she's married to Scott Harlan, who's right. so talented. Scott, yes, yeah, Scott's on Facebook. He connected me with her, and then I wanted him to come on here, but he was a little bit shy about doing that. I thought that was really cute. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a really great guy. He's a great singer and a really talented musician and actor. He's very good. Yes, he is. So how do you get to be the voice of Zaretta on G.I. Joe? You know, I have to tell you, I, I have these, these, these things that happen to me in my life that are peculiar, like things that are a first. Yeah. So I never had done any voiceovers. I had never done any cartoons, so I loved cartoons. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, I was with a, a very good agency that was called um, Worms Are Held Fun and Just. And I went up there, and I can't, what the heck is the guy's name? Uh, Don, Don, I can't think of He was the voiceover guy there. Anyway, I went in there, and signed with them for commercials, and Don Pitt, or Don Pitt, that's his name, mm -hmm. and he said to me on the way out, he, he had one of these voices like that, you know, he sounded like that, so he said to me, hey, uh, have you ever had any voiceovers? I said, no, I never have. He goes, do you want to do voiceovers? I said, yeah, sure, okay. I told him, you know, I can sing, and I'm, I had a lot of fluidity with my voice in terms of changing it up. Yeah. So my hands of God, he sent me in on... G.I. Joe, on the series. I booked it. I booked it. <laughs> the regular role on that cartoon series. I was like one of the only women on that on that show. 
And it was astounding to me because I have to say, I worked for a long time, and then I did, uh, I think, both of the G.I. Joe movies, the old ones, obviously, not the ones currently. And the only reason I didn't do it anymore was, and this is really crappy, you know, they voice matched me to somebody in Canada because it was going to be cheaper, Mm -hmm. which is really crappy. But yeah. I, I made a lot of good friends on that. The guys were great. Yeah. So many talented guys on that show. It was really a guy show. Uh, but uh, that's how it happened. I, uh, when I came home, I went to the audition, and about, I guess, a day later, my husband said, what did you hear? I said, I got it. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no. I couldn't believe it. And then I started doing uh, other, uh, you know, cartoons. Uh, I love it. I, I just love it because it's so... You, you really can be so creative. You don't have to be worried about, well, we don't like your hair. No, we don't like your makeup. Oh, you don't look good in that outfit. You can literally go there in your pajamas, you know? It's yeah. Great. And you, you, just, you just do it. You just you bring all of who you are and what you have to this character. And mm-hmm. it's fa- fantastic. I, I, the only thing I regret now is that, unfortunately, you know, a, a while back, now have taken all of that work. Right. Right. And it's, heartbreaking. it's heartbreaking. And then there's many contemporaries of yours who stayed in the game for many years and they're still doing it, you know. Like I mean I've talked to, you know, people you worked with on this show, like Michael Bell and Hank Garrett and Neil Ross. I mean oh, yeah. they they stuck with yeah. it, you know. Yeah. I like Well, the- I would I would very much like to get back into it, but living on the East Coast, uh, it's really L.A., I think, has uh, the bulk of the animation work. And if you're not, you know, if, if you're not losing stuff out to stars, then it's great. But in, in New York, I, I very rarely get up on anything that's for animation. I wish, I wish I did, because I feel that I'm even better now than I was then, because I've really played a lot with my voice and I just love it so much. It's great. Have you gotten invited to the uh, Comic Cons? I haven't. I would like to do that. I don't know how one goes about doing that, but I certainly would like to do it because uh, I do have people reaching out to me that I don't know on Facebook that say, oh, I'm a huge fan of Zorana. I have this, I have that. And they ask me if I'm, you know, going to a Comic Con. But I, I tell you, Tony, I have no idea how one goes about doing that. I don't know if that happens through an agent. They have like yeah, they, they. How does that work? They have like booking managers for the conventions. A lot of them, you know, aren't you know real quote unquote real managers. They're they're fans who like you know, um, who work the the, uh, the the convention system. You know, as a volunteer, as a money handler, and then they you know jump through the hoops, and then they become the 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 person's manager and, and what have you. But yeah, they do have them, you know, and they say generally you have to be invited, but I think that there's some way that um that people can take the initiative to ask uh conventions to book them. I don't I don't know. But yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, I would love to. I know my uh, I have a good friend of mine. Have you ever had Maggie Roswell on your show? Oh I would love to have her. She's uh The Simpsons. Oh she's Yes, yeah, 31 yeah. years. I think she's been on The Simpsons 31 years, and her husband's great, too. How real. If you're interested um, in talking to them, I'll, I'll put you in touch with her. I'll put her in touch with you if that's something she, you know, she wants to do. Oh, that, would be, great. that would be great. Yeah, I mean, she's very yeah, talented. She's a doll. She's a lot of fun. She's got a great big personality, and she's so much fun. And wasn't she a groundling? I think she was. Uh, she's done. She's done so many things that it's. Um, I can't even keep track. I mean, she. I mean, I think she was on the Carson show years ago. She. She has done a lot, including um, a lot of sitcoms and things like that. Uh, but I know that she's been very prolific in the um, animation. Certainly, just Simpsons alone. That's quite a feat. Right. When you when you did the uh, GI Joe movie, did you work in the same booth as uh, Don Johnson? Oh, I don't think so. No, I would have remembered that. I did not. Okay. No. Yeah, I always liked that character Zorana because she was she was so sexy, you know, and you know she would get into a bikini sometimes and stuff. You know, that's yeah. very rare for for a, a children's toy line cartoon at that time. Yes, yes. It, it, 
you know, it was it was really great because she was such a um, a killer, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have a, a woman be that character in a very male-dominated show was, I thought, great. Good for them. I, I, there were one or two other women at most, and I can, uh, one of them, I can't remember. I know that she used to be married to or lived with Gordon Hunt, oh. who's passed on. But I can't think of her name right now. I can't pull it up. Um, she didn't work that often. She had a lovely singing voice, too. I think a very high singing voice. Um, I can see her face. I just can't pull up her name. But that's about it, as far as I can remember. Um, it was very, very, very interesting times. The other great moment I had was I think they brought me in. I don't remember if it was Our Real Monsters or The Tick. It might have been, in, it might have been The Tick. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked in. And I was immediately stopped because my heart jumped in my mouth because Tim Curry was there. Oh. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how I adore that man. First of all, I was like the biggest groupie of Rocky Horror Show. Yeah. I probably have seen that movie, I don't know, 50 some odd times at midnight in various cities in my life across the country. And I walked in and I, I just stopped for a moment and I had I said, Mr. Curry, and he goes, oh, please, call me Tim. Yeah. <laughs> and we wound, up, we wound up working together, and that was such a treat for me. He's, what a doll, what a doll. He's so talented. He is. But I, that, was, that was a great, great moment. Really great. The, the other day on YouTube, I saw the episode you did of It's a Living. Oh, my God, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you were like a, a uh, you were like a a Brooklyn hooker type in that episode. Right. Yes, Paul Kreppel. Uh, I see Paul Kreppel often because we're we're friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so interesting, Tommy, that so much of that stuff is available on on YouTube. Yeah. But what I can't find, I've been really trying to find any anything of Private Benjamin. I can't find any of it. It's not huh. there. Yeah. It's just like I can't find it. I guess they just figure nobody wants to see it. I have no idea. I would like to see it because, you know, frankly, uh, I, I don't have, I mean, whatever I have that were on tape, I have a feeling my tape has crumbled away at this point in time. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's odd that that's never, it's never there, and it, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't run ever on any of those, um, you know, those networks that show old TV or stuff. On the eight, I never see it ever. Yeah, it's. It, I'm sure it'll resurface someday. You know, I'm sure there'll there'll be somebody who has episodes on tape that they'll put on there. You know. Uh, my earliest memory of you was the uh, classic two part episode of Married with Children. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was really great. You know, I was shocked when I got that job because. Uh, Katie Segal and I would mm. often go up to the same roles. Yeah. And, you know, she also sings. And so when I went in, I thought, I, I remember coming out and telling a friend of mine, they said, well, how'd it go? I said, well, I'm not going to get this. I said, come on. I said, Katie and I are very, very similar. But then, of course, I realized they wanted me to be a rival, so they actually did they did hire me and I, I had a great time working on that and my favorite person on it was Ed O'Neill mm -hmm. I love that man he was just a doll and a, and a lovely little the young Christina Applegate she was just a doll they were really that was a good set they, it was really nice I enjoyed that show a lot I really did uh. and then also shortly after that uh, a short lived series that I had a recurring on with a great guy Jay Oh, my God, Jay Thomas. Oh, yeah. Oh, Married People. And I loved him. He was, he was great to work with. And I was very, very sorry that, that he passed. I just thought he was really talented. And um, it was a short-lived show. Um, but I think it might have gone on more. I don't know what problems they had with it. But as I said, I, I just had a recurring on it. So. But I enjoyed that as well. Yeah, I, I love Married with Children. It's it's one of my favorite sitcoms. I just oh, yeah. I I love body humor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I I like how you, you you called her by her maiden name Wanker. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, 
you know what? The mm-hmm. original line. Mm-hmm. The original line was, I go, uh, Peggy. Wait, wait, Peggy, Peggy Wanker. Yeah. Don't, Peggy Wanker, don't bother to thank her. And yeah. he originally said to me, is that Connie? Connie Bender? Suck the chrome off your fender? <laughs> and they changed it. They changed it. I mean, it didn't pass uh, standards and practices, so it became uh, Connie, Connie Bender, bring a friend, it won't offend her. Yes. But it was, it was originally suck the chrome off your fender. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> that's even a little intense for them. <laughs> that's that's a variation on an Andrew Dice Clay joke, too. <laughs> oh, is it really? Yeah. Can she suck the chrome off of a uh, off? Uh, can she suck the chrome off of a hitch and then lay back with a beer afterwards? <laughs> oh God! Oh, okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's true. I forgot about Dice and all of his stuff. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> oh my God. Also, too, uh, David Lander, who played Squiggy on Laverne Shirley, was in that episode. Yes. yes I he was. I interviewed well, him before he passed. It was it was a it was a sad interview. Oh. Yeah. I'm ready to hear that. He was a talented guy. Very, very talented. Very talented guy. And, Go. and, and, you know, a very, very interesting um, path or uh, journey I've been on because I've gotten to do a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And and that's great because I also have kind of a short attention span, yeah. uh, which is my, my Gemini in my chart. <laughs> but, uh, in 2005, I decided to go back to graduate school. Yeah. Um, I had no idea. You know, I get these ideas. I somebody should sit me down and say, what the hell did you do that for? But I did go back and I got a, a master's degree in psychology and counseling. And I was kind of working um, in, as a therapist for a while and realized that, you know, it was very, very hard. Uh, I, I felt that uh, since I was in, working in community mental health mm-hmm. um, in a rural area, that's really hard. It's really challenging because those people um, that need help, sometimes they, they can't get to getting help, either because of financial reasons or they can't get away because of a job or they have child care they have to do. And it's, it's very difficult to be around these people that you know need so much help and they actually sometimes can't get it. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I actually then started going, I mean, I'm happy I did it. I was really, my, my head was really wanting to do it because I don't know if you know this about me, but, you know, for many, many years since I'm in my late teens, I'm a professional tarot reader. You oh, I, I did not know that. And, Okay, yeah. I'm telling you, I, I, I get into a whole lot of stuff. So because I have read cards for such a very long time, I decided that going back and getting a master's in psychology and counseling, I felt the two things might work well together, which they do in certain circumstances. Obviously, it, it would depend on what a person's diagnosis is. You would never use it in any situation that it, it wasn't appropriate to use it in. But um, it has certainly helped me in terms of, you know, I still read for people. I have clients. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. I teach it. Um, and the other great thing that it helped me with is my husband and I wrote a musical, which we are very anxious to uh, get uh, going. We're going to have a, probably in L.A., I think I'm going to be out there in September, October. Mm-hmm. We're probably going to do a reading of it. Um, and it is. I don't want to give too much of it away, but it's a jukebox musical. Nice. And we're really excited about it, and it's got a whole psychological component to it in addition to being very funny. So when I come out there, I'll have to see you. We have to get together. Yeah, well, I'm not in L.A. I'm in Reading, but, you know, I go out to L.A. and different parts oh, okay. of California all the time, you know. Oh, okay. Well, then let me rephrase it. If you get down to that area and I'm there, we'll go out and have some coffee. I would love that, yes. That would be good. That would be good. Yeah. Um, so, it's, uh, yeah, the tarot reading thing is really, um, it's pretty fascinating to me. And I don't know if you noticed, but in 1995 in L.A. at the Tiffany Theater, mm-hmm. which is like the premier equity waiver theater, then on Sunset, I, it's not there anymore, I guess. 
But anyway, they did a, a musical called Twist the State. Mm-hmm. And I, I played the lead in it. And what was really interesting was it, it, it's based on a true story. They're actually trying to revive the musical now, obviously, not with me because I'm too old for the part. <laughs> uh, but it's about mm-hmm. a woman who is a gypsy. This is true. If she was in L.A. and she got busted for fortune telling. And she got an attorney and she won the case because they said that she violated, it violated her First Amendment right. Because what the lawyer did was saying, well, wait a minute now, look at all these people that forecast the weather. Mm-hmm. Look at all these people who forecast the stock market. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, she won, they turned, they did a musical of it, and what was funny for me was when I went in and auditioned, they did not know that I was a professional tarot reader. Uh-huh. So it wound up being, it, it was a really uncanny experience because I would have to lay the cards out in the middle of these musical numbers. <laughs> and <laughs> while I'm laying them out and singing, I'm going, oh my God, in my head I'm going, look at that, that means this, so this means this, and that means that. And it was kind of a whole of surreal because it was two levels going on for me. It was really interesting. Um, but that's just an aside. Most people, well, people that know me well know I do that, but a lot of people don't know that I do that. Um, yeah, I, I have a, now you know. I was going to say I have a friend who has a, who was a, a tarot reader. She gave me a a tarot reading a few years ago. And was it good? It was somewhat good. I mean, at the time, I was um, I was uh, d- dealing with you know some um, some alcoholic family members and. Mm-hmm. And um, I had just had my my first physical in like three years, which uh, a couple of weeks later I, I was told I had to like watch my weight and all this stuff. And it was pretty it was pretty spot on, you know. She told me, you know, I needed to stop worrying about uh, my family and take care of myself, or I was going to die, you know. And then ironically, COVID uh, hit a few months later. Oh, jeez. Yeah. It is just a very interesting tool, you know, and as I say all the time, it's just a tool for, for introspection, okay? Um, yeah. When people send me how does it work, I say, okay, I put the cards down. The cards are a mirror. The car, because I have an established language with the cards, I can read what the cards are telling me. I can tell it to the person who's sitting across from me. Now, the point is this. People have free will. They can do whatever they want. doesn't mean that it's written in stone, but if you want to take the advice, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a very useful tool for self-development and, um, you know, for psychological development, for whatever you want to call it, spiritual development, however you want to phrase it. I, I think it's fascinating. But It is fascinating. Um, it's very... It's very... Some, I, I felt like I kind of made you digress. I didn't know if you were interested in asking me something else. I hope I didn't get you off point there. Oh, not at all. Not at all. No, that was very interesting, though, to, to know about that. But I was, I was curious, you know, you were on one of my favorite episodes of Perfect Strangers, the Uncle Shaggy episode. And oh, yeah. I was cu- yeah, I forgot about that, right. Yeah, I was curious to know, like, uh, what do you remember from doing that? What's his name? Bronson Tin Show, right? Bronson Pinchot and, and Mark Limbaker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I have to tell you, I don't remember that much about that. That was a long time ago. So yeah. forgive me if I can't, you know, give you any really, you know, highlights on that. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. But it was a very good experience. For the most part, uh, all my experiences, you know, give or take a few, but most, I would say most all my experiences when you're a guest have been good. As you probably know, being a guest on somebody else's show, I think, is the hardest job in television. I yeah, really do. yeah, it's because most people. T- most because, yeah, most people tell me yeah. I mean, they, they're not allowed to like talk to the star or even look at them sometimes. You know, stuff like that. Well, I don't even. That's not the part that that I you know find that doesn't bother me. What does bother me is that and and I think other actors would tell you the same thing. When you're a guest on a show, mm-hmm. you're the you're the different person. You're the odd man out. These people are working together every single week. They've got a routine down and usually anything that goes wrong, they look at the guest. 
because the guest is the replaceable person. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I never really understood. I mean, when I was, because I started out, as I mentioned before, as a series regular on Private Benjamin, you know, never, I, I didn't know what that guest experience was like until a number of years later when I finally was a guest on something. And, you know, on some shows, people don't talk to you. Yeah. They don't. I did, I did Murphy Brown. Yeah. Okay. I did Murphy Brown. I paid, played one of the secretaries. I kid you not when I tell you no one spoke to me that entire week. Oh. No one. No one spoke to me the entire week, and my friends were the executive producers of the show. Oh, my and God. And they said to me, could you tell us, is it true that our cast is not friendly? And I said, yes, it is. It is true. Actually, I will, I will, re, I will re, I'll correct myself. The only person who ever said good morning to me was the guy who played Elvin the painter, who he's gone, something, he had a tragic end. I can't remember that actor's name. Um, oh, I just saw him in something the other night, too. Do you know who I'm talking about? He, paid, he played the painter in her, like a handyman painter. Oh, I'll look him I up. Yeah, I can't remember what the actor's name was, but he, he did meet with an unfortunate end. He is the only person who in the morning when I came in, he would say, hey, how are you? That was it. Nobody else talked to me. I, it, it, it was such a daunting experience. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, listen, these people are making tons of money. How hard is it to not say to somebody, good morning? or hello, and at the end of the day, say, hey, drive safe, see you tomorrow, or whatever. Or just bye-bye, <laughs> something. Oh, Robert Pastorelli. Yes, Bob Pastorelli. Thank yeah. I, I am always amazed at that. And I'm, I can tell you, I'm not the only actor that will tell you this. It's very hard to be a guest. Very hard. Yeah. Very, very hard. Um, I, I, when I was on Private Benjamin, I saw people come on our show and... Some of the people that uh, were on our show, um, not Ann, not Lucy, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of other things, but uh, never talked to the to the guest act. Oh, never boy. talked to me. I, I didn't understand that. I mean, here I was. I was somebody from Broadway. Mm -hmm. You know, I that's not how I was trained. I mean, you know, when you're in a Broadway show, that yeah, that's your family. You know, you're seeing these people eight times a week. They're your family. Yeah. They care of each other on stage, off stage, and you seem to be interested in a person's life. Um, it was funny because way after Private Benjamin was off the air, I was at a commercial audition. And some nice young woman came over to me and, and uh, she said, You're Lisa Rachio. I said, Yes, I am. I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know your name. And she told me your name and she said, I, I just want to come over to you and tell you that when I guessed it on Private Benjamin, you were the only person that was kind to me on that show. Oh. And my heart broke, Tommy. Yeah. Broke. I said, I'm so sorry. She said, you, could, you went and got me a cup of coffee. And I remembered that. that I, I, cause I used to do that. You know, people came in, I shook their hands, and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm going to get coffee. You want something? Or I'm going by the craft service table. You want me to bring you back a donut? I mean, I, I know that's just my personality. Uh -huh. But I, I witnessed it. I witnessed people just being cruel to people that, why? Why would you do that? I don't get it. I don't get it. it. It's a tough spot to be in. Now, I'm not saying it's always that way. Yeah. But a lot of the time, it can be. Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand that either, but that's a good personality to have, Lisa, and that's why you are loved and so many people were, were happy that I was going to be talking to you today. Oh, well, thank you. That makes me feel good. You know, I just try to pay it forward. You know, it, it's we're yeah. all in it together. And it's, there's no reason, I think, for... People not to, you know, just, we're all doing it together. It's a, it's a project that's going to be dependent upon everybody's energy together. I mean, I, that's what I think. Yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm really misinformed, but um, it's, I, I did this terrible, well, which I guess it was a terrible, it wasn't a great movie, I don't want to say terrible, and it never got released. But, um, uh, What's, uh, Rita Moreno was in it, oh. and and 
and Chris, uh, oh my God, Chris from uh, SUV. Chris, the guy, the Chris, oh my God, what's his last name? He's a really great, he's a terrific, Chris Maloney. Oh, Chris Maloney. Maloney. Yeah, and Rita Moreno were, were in this movie, and uh, I think it was Martin Balsam. Mm -hmm. You know, these are big people. They, they were very nice to everybody. Yeah. I mean, what's the, you know, why, why can't you just talk to people? You know, but that was a lovely experience. And I thought it was interesting because I thought, well, you know, look at these people. They've had a you know, long, successful career, especially somebody like Rita Marino, you know? And you right. Think, oh, my goodness. So some people, some people can do it. Some people, um, some people do it, and then other people, I don't know what's going on for them, but uh, it's crazy. It's a crazy business. And maybe the same thing happens at IBM and, and other places. I don't know. But it's, it's difficult when it happens in, in a creative field like ours. Yeah. So now we get to the fun part of the show with my secret silly game. This is um, okay. a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure fun. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question and I answer it. And feel free to comment on answers. Okay. I think I've got it. Lisa, are you ticklish? Uh, sometimes. Now, are you ticklish? Oh, yes. I've been known to hit people in the groin without warning. I'm so ticklish. <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea. That's something I'd like to see soon. That would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. What's your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. My favorite part of the body? Oh, yeah. That's an interesting question. Eyes. 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 What's your favorite part of the hmm. body? The belly button. The belly button? Yeah. Oh, you like the belly button? Now, that's interesting. Now, why is that, do you think? I had a girlfriend when I was six years old who had a cute Audi belly button, and um, we went to junior high together, but we had drifted apart, and she's always kind of been the girl that got away, you know. Right. Yeah, so every time I see a belly button, I think of her. Oh, okay. Well, that, that makes it. That makes sense to me. I like that. Yeah. I like this game. Let's go. This is really great. I love this. Go on. Um, Next. Okay. What color are your toenails painted? Um, right now, a coral color. Coral. Okay. What color are your toenails painted? Uh, right now, they're not, but last time they were, they were purple with sparkles. Oh, my God. Wow, I mean, that's very fancy, isn't it? Purple with sparkles. Yeah, I, I like that. I like to you go. Might have to do something like that. Yeah, I like to go elaborate. You know. Yes. Well, purple with sparkles—that's pretty elaborate. I like that. Have you ever done like a different color on each toenail? No, I, 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 I've thought about doing that in the past, but it, it might be too expensive. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, you know, sometimes if you get, I, I find that sometimes the, the people that are doing like nails, whether it's toenails or, you know, pedicures and manicures, some of them are very, very artistic and they're just dying to put little designs on fingernails. And I love that. I had a woman once that at Christmas, she made a Christmas tree on one of my nails. Mm -hmm. I thought that was like really trippy. I loved it. It was great. Yeah. What would you say is your best personality trait? My best personality trait, mm -hmm. um, my sense of humor. You do have a good sense of humor. I do. I have a good sense of humor, and I like to be really wacky. <laughs> What's your best personality trait? I have empathy, and I have no filter. Oh, I love that. See, I love no filter. Yeah. I think we spend too much time with a filter. That's not good. No. I like no filter. Right on with the no filter. And, and good that you're empathic. That's always good. Yeah, empathy and compassion are really important. And I guess that kind of can be a problem if you have no filter. So my friends say to me, God, Lisa, couldn't you have said that slightly differently? And I'm thinking, well, you know, how many days have we got left on the planet? You asked me, do I like your hair that color? Yeah. And you want my opinion? And I said, 
no, I don't, because I thought you looked better with whatever your other shape yeah. was. <laughs> but my, I don't, what can I tell you? Karen Richmond is always on my, you know, you know Karen. I love, I love Karen Richmond. I cannot tell you how much I love her. She, she, okay, so you know, I grew up watching her on Gidget and the Brady Bunch, right? You yeah. know, these family friendly, yeah. wholesome shows, right? But then to hear her laugh at my dirty jokes, it is just, it makes my, my, my world. I love it. Let me tell you, Karen is, we're very good friends. Mm-hmm. Karen used to, Karen used to get, you know, we first met on a show in, in L.A. called, uh, well, I can't say it was a terrible show, but it, it was a little tiny show with a coast theater called Blame It on the Movies Part 2. Okay. That's where we met. And then after that, I got hired to do Studs, and I recommended Karen for the ingenue role, and she got it. And right after that, we became really great, great friends. And I love her. And sometimes she would say to me, um, oh, you know what, um... What do you think? Oh, and the other thing I should tell you is we're we're all winky. We, I don't even know how it started. She's winky. I'm winky. Joan Ryan's winky. The three of us are winky. Yeah. And nobody else can. None of us. Nobody else can be a winky. It's just the three of us. It was like we were all in studs and we became winky. Okay, yeah. So she would ask me a question, Karen. She said, "Well, what do you think of such and such?" And I said, I, "I don't know. I don't like that. I think blah blah blah." <laughs> she said to me, I remember the first time she said to me, you are like a bull in a china shop. I cannot believe you said that to me. I said, oh my God, Karen, this is a silly conversation we're having about like hair or I don't know, a pair of pants. And she said, well, you could have said it differently. And I think I said to her, there's not enough time in the day. We have other shit we have to do. <laughs> So um, she was the first person who said to me, you're like a bull in a china shop. So I am pretty direct. So I do understand when you said that, no filter, because she's always telling me, Lisa. And I go, okay, all right. Yeah. (laughs) I just adore her. Um, And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? A smell that makes me gag? A stinky smell. Yeah, there are probably a couple of them. Um, I cannot stand smelling garlic on a person. Okay. And I know that's crazy since I'm Italian. (laughs) I'm not a garlic-loving Italian. That smell of garlic, like, you know people that have had some fabulous meal and then it's just coming out of each of their pores and you want to go, oh, please, go sit in another room. I can't take it. Um, That's a bad smell. Garlic for me is bad. Yeah, it could be pretty bad. (laughs) Uh, For me, um, it's either farts or feet. Oh, farts or feet. S and F. Yeah. Yes, farts or feet. Yeah, I I can understand that. Yeah, I can understand that. And you know the problem sometimes is feet, that's... I knew somebody as a kid that said they didn't like this. They didn't like certain cheeses because they thought it smelled like feet. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. I, I, I love cheese, so I, I'm not one to ever turn down a, a, a piece of cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> uh, but, not, but not the garlic. Yeah, I'm, my mom's Italian, so, um, you know, I, I, I know the, the garlic uh, smell, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, let me ask you, where is your family from in Italy on your mom's side? Uh, you know, they're, they were Sicilian. Oh, well, maybe we, we are, we are paisans. Yes. My my uh, her mother, my grandmother, uh she was born in San Francisco and uh her parents came from Sicily. Do you know where in Sicily? Uh I'm gonna have to ask. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm half Sicilian, and I didn't know how to speak English until I got to school because I was raised by my Sicilian grandparents. Okay. Which is really kind of a, another crazy thing. I'm also an Italian citizen, so I hold dual citizenship. Yeah, we, we, we plan we plan on going to Italy someday, you know. Um, it's 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 always been on, on the list, you know. Yeah, no, me too. I mean I've only been there once and that was like only because I was in France and we went across the border and uh, but we didn't stay. We were fulfilling this French trip. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, so we're uh, we're soulmates. This is even better. I know. I know I love I, lo- I love it. It's awesome. So I got a couple jokes for you before uh, we say goodbye here. Okay. Okay. You you know the diff. 
You know the difference between a golf ball and a G spot? I do not. A man rather spend twenty minutes looking for a golf ball. Okay, I like that one. That's, that's a very good one. Now, tell me another one. Um, what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Uh, I don't know. What? A liar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. Two good ones. Oh, uh, yes, I love telling jokes. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. And yes, we definitely have that Italian soulmate thing there. <laughs> definitely. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. And I will um, I'll reach out to my friend Maggie and see, I don't know where she is these days. If she, they, they travel a lot. But I'll reach out to her and see if that is something that is uh, up her sleeve. In which case, I'll figure out a way to get you guys together. Okay? Yes, that would be great. In the meantime, you stay safe, and thank you so much. Oh, Tommy, thank you, and all the best. You take care of yourself. You Bye too. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Lisa Raggio. Ain't she a sweetheart? Uh, I'm so glad I just pronounced her name the right way that I did in the intro, but I'm so glad we got to talk today. What a great lady, huh? And a fellow paisano. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.